So, hi. Um, you all know Colleen. Someone who should still be acting, but he's doing other things now. Steve Coulter. <laughs> Michael Pollack, who started out as a guy I met who I thought might be able to do some matte paintings for the film, and ended up, ended up taking over the entire visual effects department. And, and by the end of the film, the entire editorial department, um, and is a miracle worker. And also plays Douglas Trumbull in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> What a great screening. This is the first screening in Los Angeles. It's the first screening, it's the first screening I've been to of the movie other than the premiere we had back at the Genesee Theater in Waukegan two days, three days ago. Um, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, all of you, for who've done anything to help, which includes just being here, uh, but, and more, um, for, for, for allowing us to be here. Um, I just want to say, I think you did an amazing job. project for you and it was very nostalgic. My friend Cynthia Sykes who just left was here and we remember that period so well and I think you really captured it brilliantly. Mostly because my hometown time. hasn't changed since then. So it was kind of easy to point and shoot. Everyone really loved it and, and, and you did such an incredible uh, job, Patrick, really. I, I had a lot of help. I had a lot of help. Um, I think I was lucky enough to get a great cast. I mean, you know, if you have a script that works at all and you find great actors, you win. <laughs> Casting is destiny. You know how we get together. Fred Bruce introduced us. Fred, I don't think he's here yet. Maybe he'll be here later or we'll see him afterwards. Uh, the, the amazing Fred Bruce who produced everything Francis Coppola ever did and, and Sophia Coppola's films and everything. And he and Gary Kurtz, it was, it was Fred that introduced us. We're, no, well, that's not true. Actually, we met through Melinda Jason years earlier, but Fred reintroduced us on the professional level, and it was a, it was a perfect happenstance. I mean, I can tell the Carrie Fisher story. Yeah, that doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And what's crazy is because Apocalypse Now, Carrie, Star Wars, all that, all the connections. Well, what happened originally, and 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 it all worked out for the best for everyone that that Colleen ended up doing the role. But, but originally. Um, Fred said, Carrie Fisher, let me get Carrie to read this. And Carrie read it. And she called me in the middle of the night. And, or, well, actually, she didn't call me. She, she online texted me. And she, there, was, there was a secret society we belonged to that I can't speak about that, that um, she got in touch with me through. And, um, and so we had this kind of text thing going back and forth. And she was very excited about the script. And she said, I have to do this. I have to speak these words. I love this movie. I really want to do this. And, Finally, she goes, you've got to call me. Call me, call me tomorrow. So I, call, I, I, I dialed the phone, and this, this guy answers the phone. He goes, hello. And I'm like, uh, hi, I'm calling for Carrie. This is Carrie. And I'm like, OK, but yeah, no, I'm looking for Carrie Fisher. It's Carrie, I'm telling you. And I'm like, no, that's very funny. I really, I'm just telling tell Patrick, I'm telling you, it's Carrie. It's the cigarettes. <laughs> and, she, and she was so, I mean, she was the funniest, you know, I mean, I don't know. Amazing, we had these great late night calls. But one of the things that was happening was that she was all over the map in terms of what she was doing with her writing and other roles and everything. So it was kind of this when are you going to have the money? When am I going to be available? Blah, 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 blah. And in the meantime, and Carrie would laugh at this if, I, if she heard me saying it at, at, at a, a certain point. Because sometimes I'd call her and she'd say, Patrick, I can't wait to do this. I can't wait to, or something. And then other nights she'd be like, I'm not sure why I have any reason to do this. You don't have any money. It's, you're not famous, blah, blah, blah. She was bipolar, and she was really bipolar. And and one day, Fred said to me, you know, we can get Carrie, but the problem is which Carrie will we get? <laughs> and Carrie even said that to me at one point. And so it just kind of it kind of meandered away, and then she got involved in some other project, and she wasn't really available on the dates, and, and, and we wanted someone great. And so Fred said, well, you know, what about Colleen? And I said, oh, yeah. And it was awesome, and I, it just like hit me because one of the things about the Carrie thing was I found myself rewriting the script 
with like little in Star Wars jokes around her. Like there was a moment in the kitchen where I had her, the phone was ringing while she was trying to have the conversation with Pat and she was carrying a plate of danishes and she was putting one on the plate when she went to answer the phone and put it up to her head like this, you know, so you had the big danish on the side of her head and she looked like Princess Leia and it was like, wait a minute. If I go, if I go down that road and it becomes a joke, then that character is, is, is diminished. And she found that Mark Hamill was gonna do a cameo at one point in the film. And he said, I'll do it, I'm happy to do it, but ask yourself if that helps you or hurts you. Because we are, we are not fanboys, this is a completely different kind of movie. And, it, it, and you brought truth to this, you really, my mom was really thrilled with how you played her. me very happy. Yeah. She was very, very thrilled with that, so. Anyway, I, I've, I've talked enough. Was it great? Um, I, I should open this up now quickly before you all go to sleep to any questions anyone has to, for any of these folks here, or me. Anybody? Anything? Yes? Hey, Pat. Um, Lisa. <laughs> so, one thing I wanted to say, well, it was great, I loved it. I've known about this movie forever. Right. And I remember being at your house in uh, Watford. And uh, I, I love the locations, like, let, that J.C. Penny, you know, it's so captured the 70s, and uh, that was incredible. And that wasn't even there. That, Mike put that in. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, that's, that's, a, a, that's a photograph of an old J.C. Penny. I, could, I couldn't believe it. I thought, where, where, where was that? But then I thought maybe it was in that small town. And I love seeing Cody and Merrick, and that was really sweet. Well, yeah, my, my daughter Merrick, who's now 21, just has a couple of weeks ago, um, actually plays me as the eight-year-old me in the theater watching 2001 Space Odyssey. We, we cut off her beautiful long hair, dyed it blonde, put her in boy clothes, and because she looked so similar to me at that age facially that we were able to use this old Super 8 movies and, 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 and photographs from the time and mix and match, and, and she seemed to look just like that character, so it really helped us uh, in that way. I think she's forgiven me now. <laughs> but anyway. Oh, I'm sorry. She looks gorgeous. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, she, yeah, she, she, was, cute. she was cuter than I was at that age. But <laughs> So what I wanted to ask you yeah. was, I mean, this being the, the, the anniversary and there's so much buzz about Star Wars going on, what's next for 52577? That's up to you guys. <laughs> to <laughs> tell your friends. How, however many great reviews we get, however much buzz gets out of not only this, but we, we, we opened today in 32 screens across the country. Now, 30, th does anyone know the significance? Yes. Yeah, it was the same amount of theaters that Star Wars was in. Yes. So, you know, maybe it will all just turn out exactly the same. <laughs> um, it, was, it was coincidental. We didn't plan it that way. Uh, I, but I did say to the, I did say at one point to the film booker, if you get to 32 screens, there's a bonus. <laughs> and he said, why? I said, I'm not telling you. So, but he got there just before we opened. Um, but to, to answer the question about another, uh, what goes on for with uh, 525.77 from here, I'd say production is just kicking in. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This was, this was sort of a demo reel. And, and, and well, actually, uh, you know, our partners, uh, Filmio, uh, are primarily, uh, they, 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 they're going to be financing all kinds of things, but they're also, uh, in many ways, a digital distribution platform, and they're, and we're sort of their premier project to come out on that platform. And over the next 30 to 90 days, we will be doing a special edition of this film, which includes heretofore unseen footage and, 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 all, ki and all kinds of things that we just, a year ago today, I made an announcement to my friends, my family, and to the fans of the film that exists out in the world that this movie would come out on this day. And I had no idea how I was gonna achieve that. Because we still had work finished, we weren't close to being finished. And thankfully, you know, Peter Bowers, uh, one of our producers, and uh, was, was friendly with, or getting to be friendly with the folks from Filmio. We all got together, we started discussing it, they liked the movie, I liked them, we liked their platform, we, and, we, and suddenly I had a, a way to get here. And, but we, by the time we got it all figured out and on the road and ready to go, we really didn't have enough time to do it quite the way I wanted it. But this is, this is, 
and all directors say this. I mean, I know George, when Star, when Star Wars was put in theaters, he was frantic at, at what wasn't done. So there's so, there, I'm sitting, while well, you're seemingly really enjoying the film, I'm sitting here in my chair just going, oh, okay. oh, oh, not that shot. Oh, no, oh, geez, you know. And so with the digital version, we're going to be able to do a lot of cleanup. And I don't mean special edition style where we're, like, going to, you know, flog it to death with effects. But, but just, there's some, there's some plot material that's still on the floor that when it comes back in will be really fun. And in a digital environment, when you're watching it at home, you can watch something a little longer if you choose. You'll have both versions available. So we've got a little bit of work ahead of us. Again, uh, sorry. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> Perfect. After a small, short vacation. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, did you have to deal with the uh, Kubrick estate to get the one quick shot from 2000? We did. Oh, and, and, and interestingly enough, that was the easy part. <laughs> and Lisa knows what I'm talking about. Um, the Kubrick estate, Jan Harlan, who is uh, uh, Christian Kubrick's uh, brother and is kind of the executor of what happens with the film division of the Kubrick family, um, watched the film because Gary Kurtz, who's one of our producers, is very close with Jan, and he had talked to both Jan and the family about it years ago, and they said, look, this sounds great. We're predisposed to saying, yes, we'd just like to see the final scene that the clip is in. And so we showed it to them, and they were like, wonderful, we love it, go ahead. Now go contact you know this lady at, uh, at, at Warner Brothers, who's the gatekeeper uh, you know, for Warner Brothers. And that's where things got interesting. Um, you know, she was very protective of, and, and rightly so. I mean, we're really fortunate to have had even a smidgen of Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece at the beginning of our film. We used to have a whole lot more in there, but when you, when they said it would be twelve thousand a clip, you know, for each each cut to a, a moment from the thing, we just we had to pick one, so the monolith, which was thematically correct. It used to be, we had the Star Child cut in before, but that, that was a no-no. Uh, the family was fine with it, but Warner was like, nobody gets a clip of the Star Child. You can't show it, it can't be done. It was like, oh, you're killing me. <laughs> you know, but, but you didn't know it, so you didn't miss it. So. Um, yeah, it, it, but yes, we dealt with them. And they, the family were great. Um, you know, and Warner Brothers has been great, too. It was just, they were much more protective than even the Cooper family was at this point of that, of that legacy. So. Uh, and he would, yes. Did you speak about Gary Kurtz's full involvement in the film? Yes, uh, Gary. Uh, Gary Kurtz. A long time. I have a friend out in the audience, Mike Petzl. Um, where's Mike? Is he still like, hey, you, you stayed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> right around the time that, that Mike and I were sort of partnering up on a bunch of stuff at Universal and Warner Brothers and stuff, uh, Gary Kurtz sort of came into our lives and my life. Um, we were introduced by a man named Ed Elbert, another producer. And, and Gary and I hit it off famously. Um, you know, I, I keep my Star Wars fandom very hidden, believe it or not. Even though I spent 13 years <laughs> making a film about it, I don't, I don't own action figures. I don't have, you know, a, 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 a boy cave filled with models and posters or anything like that. It just, that's not really my thing. Um, but I had been pitching a story called uh, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, and, and, and Mike had been involved in helping me figure that out. It was basically an American graffiti for my generation, for the 70s. And I had pitched it to Gary, and he said, yeah, it's a bunch of really wonderful little vignettes and events, but what's the hook, what's the through line? And I was like, oh, I'm losing him. I'm not, I, I don't have to, I'm gonna lose Gary Kurtz. So I finally went, well, can I tell you a little story about Star Wars? And he, and he rolled his eyes, because like, he wants to hear another story about Star Wars. And then I told him, this. And by the time it was over, he said, well, that's your movie. So whatever the events are that you glom onto it, you can pick and choose. They're like, you know, the different chips of paint, the color, the, the, the corners of this movie with, but that's your through line. And I said, really? And he goes, I'll make that movie. So that's how it happened. So, yeah. Yes? Uh, did you ever get in contact with your old friends again? And like about this movie? Not only did I get in contact with them, um, let me tell you a couple of things. Todd, the theater manager, right? That's the real Bill. Whoa. My best friend in high school plays Todd, the theater manager. Okay? <laughs> the, the, nurse that, the nurse that comes out and says, congratulations, it's a fist, right? Yeah. All right, that's Robin Brayton, the actual Robin, <laughs> who actually did get her fist stuck in her mouth. Um, uh, who else? Uh, well, and, and, and Don Allen is here. Where's Don? In the back. That's the guy who, who deconstructed me no on way. the bench. That's the guy who just who is now the corporate psychologist for for Home Depot, right? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. 
In fact, there, there was talk at one point of doing um, a, a sequel. <laughs> no, one, no one will live that long. But <laughs> the idea was we would do something called, uh, the, the, the sequel would be um, 525.90, The Empire Strikes Pack in which I've, I've made my first feature film, Space Invaders, I've, uh, I've gotten a divorce from my first wife, uh, I'm about to I embark on my next movie, and things, everything comes crashing down, and it ends in horror and despair, and I leave Hollywood, okay? Uh, which is kind of Empire Strikes Back like. And then the third movie was going to be Return of the Alumni, in which all my friends come back and make this movie. So, <laughs> but we're not doing that. <laughs> well, yes, Harry. Uh, were you always going to play your dad? Did you? No. Well, no. It originally, and in fact, it took <laughs> it took these many years for me to age into him <laughs> to become him. Um, so it kind of worked out. But originally, believe it or not, Joe Pantoliano did he did some test stuff with me. He was going to play him because we were friends, and he kind of looked the part in a weird way when he put on glasses. And um, and then for a, a brief, uh, there were a couple of different people that were going to play it over the years, and we just never got around to shooting that stuff. And by the time we did. I didn't have the budget, or and, and frankly, at the time, I finally decided, you know what? It's the movie at this point has become just as much an exorcism as an exercise in filmmaking, and and it, I needed to play the part. Um, I don't know if I did a good job, but I, it but it felt. <laughs> no, I'm not asking. Thank you. No, no, I, it, it was, no, no, please, no, no. I, I was. I, I, it's hard for me to watch it, but I also knew that with with, for example, the young lady who plays. Uh, young Janet in the beginning of the movie, um, Jenny Hopkins, who's kind of remarkably like you guys are like, it's really interesting. Yeah, and, she, and 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 to get her and the kids to go to the places I needed them to go, I needed to be as scary as my dad, and I guess I didn't trust anyone else to be that scary. You know that that kind of disturbed at that time. So anyway, I, I did. I loved all those all those flashbacks or that. With, with the kids and with you in it, I mean that was that was something that really tied together. That and that was re relatively recent. Uh, yeah, we shot that about think, a year right? ago, actually, um, and it 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 was cathartic. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, I wish I'd really been drinking when I was playing it as a drinker, but I you know, couldn't do that. Yes, in the back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. You first, and then we'll go to you. Yeah. For me? Yes. You said you went back the last year and you shot more stuff. Like, what formats did you use? Uh, Everything. Uh, Everything. Whatever. Whatever was within reach. I mean, I'm telling you, this movie was shot originally. The, all of the Wadsworth, uh, Lake County, Illinois stuff was all shot in um, Super 16 millimeter 185 on Panavision cameras, um, and then the. <laughs> And then the Hollywood stuff was all super 35 anamorphic with these great old Russian lenses with lots of aberrations and flares and everything in them, but you know, beautiful widescreen stuff. But in between for, for pickups, we did everything from HVXs to a Sony or a Canon X01 to uh, any Canon 5D. Uh, Shaw Fisher, <laughs> who's in the crowd here, uh, just stand up, Shaw. Shaw's a, a former student of mine at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts Film School, um, and he. Uh, grew up into an incredible professional cinematographer who came back and helped us out on what we call the Candy Valley Miniatures, which were re a lot of these shots, like the, the shot of the Pinto sliding in when it crashed, when it comes sliding into the parking lot. I shot that four days ago. It was a miniature we shot in the front yard, literally, well, five days ago now, I guess it was. Um, and, <laughs> and there were well, that whole Pinto takeoff sequence used to be, if anyone remembers any older cuts of the films that are here, it used to be a kind of motion graphics animated fantasy thing that was sort of weird and cool, but a little distant. It didn't really pull you in. And we thought, what's wrong here? Should we make these effects better? Should we go to John Knoll and ask for another favor and get some more super amazing ILM effects? Or should we make them worse? So we decided to go, what could he do in his garage in 1977? And that was the Candy Valley Miniature Unit. So, anyway, uh, yes, in the back. Steve, what was your favorite memory from filming in Illinois? Is that Mark Benning? It is. Mark what? Benning. This was on oh, money back God. here. You in the We're back? Stand up, Mark. That boys. Mark, come up here. All right, Mark, come up here. Mark, you fucking killed that scene, okay. by so, the way. Mark Benning, everybody, who plays Donnie Allen, the guy who psychoanalyzes me in the movie. Dude. I'm a big fan. 
Big fan. Of all you. I mean, this is a, this is unexpected. This is, this is great. But what was your favorite uh, memory of filming in Illinois? My favorite memory, um, you know, it, it's hard to say. There was, you know, one, it was 12 years ago, so it was. <laughs> um, what, you know, I, I got maybe. Maybe that whole uh, all of the all of the party scenes there. Where I, I guess there was this whole sequence with the um, kind of the scene towards the end with with the party. Uh, that to me was just kind of crazy. Because I, I think my favorite thing actually. I mean, so Mark and I went to the same high school, and like we used to, us and several of our friends used to be much like Pat Johnson back in our backyards. You know, when we were in high school. And we, we were both in college when this movie was, was, was made. What was the one, the escape from, what was the alien? What was it, the Zero Conspiracy? Yeah, well we don't want to talk about our movies, but we made our fair share of our own, you know, they were bad. remakes of speed were bad. on bikes and things like that. But but anyway, so I think for me it was it was the opportunity to kind of work on this film with, actually, you know, all of, all of the, all of those high school students in the film were, you know, apart from uh, apart from John Francis Daly, were all uh, locally cast uh, throughout yeah. Chicago, Lake yeah, County. But yeah, I mean, Caitlin, uh, who was the the Trekkie, and Gwen, who uh, plays Pat's sister in the film, and, and Mark and myself, Nick Harden, um, Michelle. Yeah, Lee so Lee. so there's like, a whole bunch of folks who you know we all. Did theater with, kind of made our own movies with and stuff in our backyard, and now here we all got this opportunity to kind of work on this, you know, uh, bigger budget independent film, uh, you know, and, and you know, I, to, to me that was just that was just a trip. I mean, that you know, when we weren't when we weren't, uh, you know, doing our thing, you know, rehearsing a scene or something, I was always kind of back with the crew, asking questions and kind of learning, you know, how they're doing these things. So I don't know. In a way, I, I had my fair share of moments like. Like Pat when he went to Hollywood, and like what the hell is going on here? And I don't even had any understanding what they're talking about, but you know, just kind of sitting there in awe. So I, I think just that that experience really was was I, I remember being really cool for me. So how about you, Mark? I remember there was like during the shoot where there was the party scene late at night it was like a night shoot, and it, end of itself there was like an area set up back in the side that all the PAs would wrangle the actors into, and John was in the back watching Arrested Development because he got the DVDs and he was crazy about it. But I, it was it was great to me because my family didn't believe that I was shooting a movie <laughs> still. So I remember driving back, getting back at like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and my dad was like, where were you? <laughs> we were shooting a movie, 525-77. He's like, why is it ending now? And I'm like, I don't know. I guess that's just how it works. But I just remember those party scenes, and then the auditioning process was a was a trip. But it was it was really fun. Awesome. Yes. Uh, what did your old friends think of the movie? Donnie, what do you think? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> He's embarrassed. I asked the question, man. <laughs> you know, I, I a bunch. We we just at the premiere in in in, in Waukegan. Robin was there, you know, um, and Don Ferry, who's a character in the movie briefly, who like if you miss her at the drive-in, she's the girl Bill's kind of hanging out at the drive-in. Uh, she grew up to be a, a legit Use the mic. production designer who the came mic. back in production and designed this film. Use the mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Say what? Noreen's here too. You know, there's Noreen Dion? Oh, well, Noreen, no longer Dion, but Noreen Dion. Yeah. Oh, well, old friend. We've got, we, it's, it's been, Kind of phenomenal. I mean, we we had a really amazing response. I mean, it's for I mean, everybody in this movie, except for a couple of the bad guys, is a real human being that lives and breathes and walks around and is still here. And so far, I've gotten good reviews from everybody about their portrayal. Donnie, you look you, you come off pretty cool. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> partially him, partially me, but mostly you. Who else? Yes. What uh, what went into recreating the Star Wars effects shop? Okay, that, that's a that's a really cool story. So, the, that was part of our second shoot that took place in 2006. We had we had not gotten enough money to finish the movie in 2004, so we sort of laid dormant for a year uh, and a half, and then finally found some more funding and went to shoot the whole Hollywood sequence. 
And the, the future general, Lucas, or, uh, you know, Douglas Trumbull scene and the ILM scene were done in an old abandoned toy store near the, an abandoned mall named Lakehurst in Waukegan, Illinois. And we, we brought in all the material and the people, and we had a production designer who was not Don Ferry, who was there, who was not hired by me, but hired by the line producer, who knew nothing about this stuff and was so intimidated, either intimidated or bored, I'm not sure, by the process of creating the new ILM that she just kind of avoided it until about a day before we were supposed to shoot it. And I came to the set, and I'm like, well, the, the non-set, the empty warehouse, I'm like, where's ILM? She's like, I don't know, I just don't, I don't feel how to make it, that's not very interesting, you know, I'm like, I, but it's necessary, you know. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's a guy named Rick Inglesby from Buffalo, New York, who had built a Star Destroyer model so beautiful and realistic that Lucasfilm would often take it on tour around the country and claim it was the actual one from the movie, right? <laughs> we had found out about it, and as, uh, as a reach, reaching out to lots of model makers to try to find models for that scene, we had met Rick, and he had said, yeah, I'll bring my model out, I'll drive it out from Buffalo, New York, and babysit it, and put it in your movie, and, and I was like, this is amazing. So Rick comes out with his beautiful model, he sets it up in this empty space where there's supposed to be an ILM, and there's nothing there, and he sits there for a few days watching us shoot the other stuff with Steven Spielberg about trouble. Meanwhile, nobody's building ILM, and finally I just had it. And I say to the producer, we got to do something. And she's like, she goes, well, Marie doesn't know what to do. She's, she's feeling like she, it's not really her thing. And I'm like, it doesn't matter if it's her thing. We need it. So I finally went up to Rick one day, and I just walked back. I said, Rick. And he goes, yeah. And I said, if I gave you this entire crew and all the materials in that back room and 24 hours, can you build ILM? And he goes, ah, yeah, sure. <laughs> and I field promoted him to production designer of that scene, and he went in, and in 24 hours, he built ILM wow. from scratch. Now, not, that you'll notice in that scene, there's dolly track everywhere in the shot, because we're dolly, it's, a one, it's one single shot, right? And we left the dolly track in because there was dolly track everywhere at ILM anyway, why not just see it, right? It, it's kind of a meta fun thing. But like, for example, the Millennium Falcon wasn't there. John Knoll at ILM, my best man at my wedding and vice versa, who I've known since I was a model maker back in the 80s, he said, I'll put the, don't worry, I got the Millennium Falcon, I've got it up here at ILM, I'll put it in for you, right? The, 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 the Death Star surface at the beginning wasn't there, there was just three ping pong balls, you know, to register it, and he dropped that in for us. The cloud tank, the Douglas Trumbull cloud, cloud tank, that wasn't there, he put that in. Um, and, and like when, you, when you're going through the, at Island at one point and you see the Death Star on the blue screen stage, that's just a photo cutout of the Death Star. Just matched, and we matched the lighting that was on the photo cutout, and you can't tell. You know, but it was all just tricks, all just illusion. You know. Yes? How many stories in this film were, were real, including this, the part where John Dykes were smashing that next wing with that? Yeah. That. Absolutely. I'll, let me put it this way. Like I said at the beginning, most of this is true. The rest is even truer, right? The true stuff is the weird, incredible, insane, unbelievable stuff. The stuff that's fudged a little is the connective tissue that kind of takes three years worth of events and collapses into, and collapses into one and makes it more of a dramatic through line. You know, there's, there's, there's stuff that had to be done to pull things together. But the Hollywood sequence from front to back is, is literally word for word what happened and moment by moment what happened. I, I wanted that to be as true as possible because it was so insanely impossible that to, to, to write it up or to write it any differently than it, than it really was would have hurt it. And I also didn't want to get sued. <laughs> so, so I mean it literally happened word for word, moment for moment, exactly as you see that stuff. And a lot of the dialogue sequences, you know, uh, I mean, I, I will say that the villain in the piece is actually a conglomeration of, of people, right? He's not a single, he's, he's a, a, an amalgam of, of several villains in my life at that time. But, uh, and so we got, you know, we didn't have to name one person. Uh, but that mo almost everything in it happened, not necessarily in that order, and not always the exact same people that are portrayed. There's, there's some fudging there, but, but mostly it's true. Yes? Was Tony a real person, and did you actually have a fight with him that ended in you quoting 2001? <laughs> um, that's a little meta. Um, now, Tony, Tony is a conglomeration of, as well of, of about two or three characters. And I did have a confrontation with him, but it wasn't quite as spectacular as that one. Um, we, I took some license there. Yeah, no question. Yeah. Hi. Yes? What's going on with Parts of Darkness? <laughs> wow. That's a hi, Stephanie. <laughs> um, Hearts of Darkness. She's referring to uh, in, tw in 2012. Um, 
my, at the time, girlfriend and a bunch of my uh, compatriots in the movie jumped in the Ford Pinto and a giant RV called Large Marge with a bunch of GoPro cameras and some chase cars. And we set out from Wadsworth, Illinois, population 750, for all points west to try to sort of test screen the movie and promote it on this kind of wild cross-country tour called the Hearts of Darkness Tour. And as we went across the country, we would, you know, like we'd stop at Devil's Tower, Wyoming, and we'd build a hand strung screen 40 feet across at the base of Devil's Tower, and we showed the movie there, you know, and we, for the KOA campground people. And we, we showed it at the Alamo Draft House in Austin. And we, we, you know, we'd find fun, cool locations. And then we'd get stranded for a month at a campground in Kansas, you know, out of money, you know, and it was this crazy adventure. And we collected a lot of footage for that, and it, 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 it was eventually supposed to become a, like a Kickstarter documentary, right? But then, and then you know, and you know well, Stephanie, because we actually stayed with you for a while. Um, then things went south, and uh, there was there was you know, my, my ex girlfriend and I kind of weren't seeing eye to eye on what to do with the footage. Yeah, she wanted to turn it into a personal documentary, and I wanted to turn it into what it was meant to be. And she, and, and but it's all kind of come full circle. Things are getting better again, and I think we're actually going to see see it come out eventually, um, maybe even this year. It might be part of our whole digital release now. It it just took a minute for everybody to get their heads on straight. So yes. Colleen, did your kids meet Pat's mom? I did. Yeah, you did. You should. Yes, yes, I did. Um, uh, and she was wonderful. I got to meet her, and we shot the entire role in like a few days. Patrick, I'm just trying to remember how quickly we shot it. Because so I remember I came in like on a night. It was it was very quick. Um, and I think, if I remember correctly, we, we got on the phone, and I think I got on a plane like the next day or something. Wasn't it that quickly? Or very soon. And then I got to meet her mother yeah. while we were there. But I wasn't, I'm trying to remember how long I actually was there. You were, well, you were there only, I think, two or three weeks, I think. We, well, we was it, limited engagement, you know, very, very busy actors. And I think you were there three weeks. Was it there three yeah. weeks? Yeah. It just seemed like forever. <laughs> For you. I, 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 but I remember it was very quickly, I got, it was like, we got off the phone and I, I got there for like two days or yeah. something. And your mother was there and yeah. she was wonderful. Well, I wanted to get them in the same room to, to, to have my mom's sort of alien DNA infect her. Um, and you picked it up. Yeah, she, she was amazing. You know, it's, it's such a, it's so serendipitous because in 1975, I met Fred Bruce on a movie called Smile. Yeah. And, which was shot in the Santa Rosa. And then uh, Fred, you know, then we, I did Apocalypse Now in 76, 77 with Fred. And, and then you, at that time, you, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember when you first... You and I met when I first got to Hollywood because of Melinda Jason, you know, my, our man, my manager and your friend that put us together. And I think she brought you to some goofy party I had at my house and we hit it off. And, we really hit it off. So his yeah. mother was amazing, and what a tribute to her! Uh, amazing, Thanks. she was incredible. Thanks. Yes. Um, so I still don't understand the part where um, Pat's mom was looking through the 2001 Aussie book, and she found out um, Herb's phone number. Like, how did she do that? Well, what happened was, I mean, and, and in that sequence, what she basically was looking through these old, you know. You know, I had magazines under my bed, like all healthy young American males, you know, American <laughs> cinematographer magazines, right? Yeah, not so, and, and she found these, and she literally thought, wait a minute, she, she's leafing through this magazine, she's seeing all these famous people that I want to meet. She's like, well, whoever wrote this magazine clearly knows these people, why don't I just call him? So she flips to the front of the magazine, finds the name of the editor, and in those days, they actually put like a phone number you could call in front of the magazine, like to call the editor. Now you forget it; you're never going to get to them, you know. But um, and she literally just cold called him. She just <laughs> and and her to to his dying day to, would tell the tale with tears of laughter. You know, it, 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 he would tell how he was utterly beguiled and seduced by this woman over the phone. And I I could believe till till his dying day he had a crush on her, though they never met in person. But I really think I think he was. Like deeply attracted to her because of this phone call. So, anyway, yes, yes. Talk a lot about filming in this year. 
So exactly how long ago did you finish the final filming and editing for this movie? Uh, <laughs> you want to speak to that? <laughs> I, I don't know the final is five I mean, yeah, never yeah, what time is it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, we literally, well, let me put it this way. When I was uh, on stage like this at the beginning of the premiere on the 22nd, I had to vamp for about 15 minutes while Mike drove pedal to the metal from Ingleside, Illinois to Waukegan with the final cut file um, uh, in his little hard drive, you know, or big hard drive, sorry. Um, <laughs> and we, we literally, I was literally kind of talking to the audience and looking at the projection booth, hoping to see something other than people hanging from nooses, you know, and, uh, and I finally got the thumbs up like 15 minutes after we were supposed to start, so it was, that's when we finished, basically. Yeah. And, yes? Did you find that the the people that you met the first time you came out to Hollywood and then you came out the second time, were they receptive to helping you? Yeah, yeah, mostly they were. Um, you gotta remember that I, first of all, I was, I, mean, I came out at a moment when, and I was so interested in visual effects at first when I got out of Hollywood, I didn't much know or care about the directing thing as much as I cared, I, I cared about writing quite a bit. And I also cared deeply about getting involved in visual effects because I was a model maker. I had a little bit of a skill set that I could apply to this. And so going, uh, when I came back out, I literally went you know, to the, the same visual effects people that I met before and others and, and landed a job the first week I was out here. You have to also remember that Star Wars spawned this explosion of interest in people building miniatures. You know, they needed models for all the imitation films and all the new action and science fiction films that started to happen. So model makers were suddenly in huge demand and there was a very limited supply. So I got a job the first week I was there. It was mostly a job using my Ford Pinto to drive, you know, like a bat out of hell all over LA picking up model parts or paint supplies or and saw blades, but, but they would occasionally let me actually build a model when I wasn't doing that, and that's how I got in. Yeah. But did, did you like go back to Spielberg or Lucas and say, hey, I'm back, hire me? Not to those guys specifically. Well, I did go back to Doug Trumbull, um, and, and, and I did start working for him within a short time uh, at his show scan company at the time, uh, doing everything from storyboards to writing little scripts for some of the short show scan films. Um, I didn't want to go back to Steven or anyone like that until I had something to show them other than eagerness. You know, I needed to at least make a film. And, and, and in fact, my first feature film, Space Invaders, the only reason it was ever in a theater was that Steven saw it and got Jeffrey Katzenberg to buy it and put it in 1,500 theaters. Uh, after it had, it had no distribution, it was just this goofy little thing we made for 10 cents in a t-shirt in a warehouse in North Hollywood. And when Steven saw it, he just said, I'm, I'm picking this up, I'm getting this picked up, you're going to be, uh, have feature release, which was amazing. Um, I wanted to buy that, you know, hold that card until I had something to use, use it on, you know, so. Um, yes? Do you still have the footage from the childhood movies you made? Mostly no. Um, the Planet of the Apes footage that you see in the film of our, is all recreation done with my kids in, in, a, in a cornfield behind the house and, and, you know, with actual super eight cameras and super eight film. What happened was, in those days, you didn't have, I mean, there was a reversal film, so there was no negative. There was no tape copy. There's no digital backup. You just had what you got back from Kodak, and you sliced it together, and you had it on a big reel, and you, you know, if anything happened to it, you were doomed, right? Well, my mom, who was raising all these Airedale Terriers and showing them all over the country and breeding them and, and becoming like this famous kennel, had all these millions of little single reels of Super 8 footage of these dog shows. And there was this special big dog show that was happening where she wanted to, all these hundreds of people were coming, she wanted to spice all the stuff together into one big reel and show it at this big banquet, right? So she said, Patrick, can you do that? They said, yeah, I've only got one big reel though, my movie's on it. And I said, but uh, I'll, I'll do it for you. So I unspooled the movie into a big hefty bag, you know, a nice clean plastic trash bag, right? And put it in my closet and, you know, sliced her movie together, handed it to her, went to school, came back from school, went to get my hefty bag out, and there's no hefty bag. In <gasps> and my room's really clean. And I was like, the cleaning lady came. And, I, and so we called her and I said, did you find a hefty bag in my closet? She goes, oh yeah, I was really, I was glad to find it because I thought we were out. And, you know, there it was, and I just used that to clean the room. And yeah, and, it went, and luckily the garbage man came today. So somewhere in some landfill in <laughs> Illinois lies my requiem for the Planet of the Apes film. So I had to recreate it. You know. Yes. What, what is the, this time span of this movie? 
Of this film? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in, yeah, the, yeah. The, the story that's told here takes place from September of uh, 76 through May 25th of 77. But when did you start shooting? Oh, but the, for us, uh, that, that, it started in the late Pliocene era. Uh, <laughs> and, and we, um, we started shooting, I started writing it in 1999, got it financed in 2003, started shooting in 2004. About 75% of it finished and then went into you know hibernation until 2006. Shot then, then did another shoot almost a year later, I think, yeah. and then in LA, and then and then did tons of little pickup sh shoots ever since, you know, just to change things and add things. And the, the great thing was, is my investors, we didn't pre sell this at all, we didn't have foreign sales, we didn't have we had no deadline other than than our investors wanting to eventually see their money back. But they were all like, listen, keep, just do it and make it and make it good. We'd rather you took a long time that it was good than you rush it out because you feel like there's somebody breathing down your neck. And that was really amazing. Super. I mean, it, the movie, had we come out when we originally intended to, I don't think we would have had nearly as good a film. And I think we would have been destroyed by the fact that after the prequels, Star Wars was kind of a, I mean, literally, we had buyers saying, Star Wars is over. You know, and, and I already knew, and I knew at the time some of the plans for what was coming down the pike for Lucasfilm, and I couldn't use that to save my film because I would have been excommunicated from my relationship with Lucasfilm. So I was like, oh my God, if only I could tell you what's coming, you know, so. Um, yes? Uh, how, this is for you and Mike, how was it kind of looking back to uh, your roots and shooting the practical effects and using more compositing techniques that are a little more backward looking versus visual effects now? That's a good question because it, it, it's really evolved over time. Um, for a, a period of time, we didn't have that idea of sort of making them uh, retro or puppets or whatever it is, uh, sock puppet notwithstanding. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I actually remember uh, it was a St. Patrick's Day, probably, uh, I'm serendipitous, I guess, St. Patrick's Day, um, about two or three years ago. And I remember talking to you on the phone and said, like, if we can't get in and out of stuff, or if we've got these effect sequences that we can't do, why don't we just use puppets, cutouts, whatever, whatever it took, whatever it looked the most junky, but let's make them look junky. And I remember also another time, we've debated over time whether the matte paintings in the film or the any of the effects would only go as so far as what could be done in 1977. So maybe you'd see hard matte lines around characters and things that would look uh, photochemically uh, composited instead of digitally perfect. Um, but we kind of, so that's probably a little jarring and, and uh, it, people won't know. For us, it just it came down to, again, it wasn't just a matter of cost and, and availability. It was really an aesthetic choice that, that we, because we would screen the film for people and we would have these lovely screenings and at the end I would make all these apologies for these sort of rough hewn Mac-based you know, digital effects. And, and I'd say, we're gonna make those better. And the audience would go, no, 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 don't, no. Don't make them better. They're charming that way, but they weren't. They weren't charming enough for us, so we said, let's just press them down, let's push them back into the dirt. And I asked, and I knew we were okay when I asked uh, Sandy Cholera, who's this terrific makeup effects guy, you may have heard of him, he's, a, he's a kind of a famous, um, you know, rubber and servos, you know, monster maker, right? And he said, do you need any help on this? And I said, you know what I need? I need a John Francis Daly G.I. Joe astronaut. <laughs> and he's like, Doug? And so he sculpted that little John Francis Daly G.I. Joe that's in the spaceship Pinto. And when we saw that, when we first tested it, when Sean and I first put it in front of the camera, we were like, oh man, this is so charming. This is so cool. Uh, and we, we shot that. I mean, there's so much more footage of this doing lots of different things. And, and you know, maybe there'll be more of it in the digital release. Who else? Anybody? Hi. Hello. Hey. Um, I have a two-part two question. Uh, first one is, what was your favorite um, the entire movie, like whether it was an emotional challenge, uh, physically for the crew or mentally, um, and then my other question was, what was your favorite thing to shoot and what's the same? Uh, so the first one was, what was my favorite thing to shoot? Like, uh, 
Um, the trouble sequence, right? Well, yeah. You know, any, anything, when, whenever Mike came on set, it was like, you know, um, Heaven's Party, you know, Fires of Angels. Um, honestly, I have to say, when when the friends were together, the young friends were together, Bill and, and Don, I, I really liked doing the hospital scene quite a bit, the, you know, the little confessional on the bench, even though it's, it's kind of a static scene, it's got a lot of emotional, you know, potential. Um, in terms of, you know, party scenes and things like that, they're very difficult, there's a lot of, there's a lot of you know, hurting to be done. Um, these guys, you know, the younger cast, I mean, I love working with Colleen, I love working with the other adults, but watching these young people who were all, who all knew each other, basically, except for John Francis Daly, um, watching them kind of integrate their actual lives and their experiences into their performances was really kind of, really fun. Really, really interesting to watch, both on and off set, actually. Well, and all, all the crew was kind of teaching us the 70s as well. <laughs> so, so, I, so I think you all enjoyed that aspect of it as well. Of like, you don't, you don't know what this is. Like, let me tell you about. We, we never stop about these it. Earth shoes. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we never um, stopped living it. I mean, it really. But the funny thing was, it really didn't take much to make what, uh, Lake County, Illinois, look like the seventies. You occasionally you had to remove, you know, some modern cell tower thing or a, 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 some kind of a, you know. Uh, just keep the, the modern cars out of the way, and even that, there were so many classic cars in that area. It's like the the, the, the Sargasso Sea of, of classic cars, Lake County is. But uh, yeah, who else? Yes. Oh, I was going to ask you what it's like to edit for twelve years, but uh, <laughs> what, it's great. How, how did <laughs> having that all that time right. uh, affect? The, I mean, did you change things over the twelve years? Oh, oh, so oh, many ideas yeah. that would come to you and. Oh, well, listen, here's one of the things that uh, anybody who got involved late in the game on this film, they are such, such a disadvantage of it because they all come in with ideas and they come in with ideas that are really good. And believe me, we've done them. There, there, there's probably not an angle of attack that you could take on this material that has not been taken in that many years. And there was a period of time that we didn't really even control the film when, when Morris Agency had sort of control over it. And they were demanding all these changes and cuts. Like they said, you don't need that hospital thing. Ah, what that soliloquy? Ah, one more, blah blah blah. You know, it was like it was the heart of the film. It was the turning point in his right. You know, and we. Uh, so, it, it honestly, at a certain point, when it was put down for a year or two at a time, and I didn't work on it at all, that was the best possible thing that could happen. Because at least I could come back to it going, oh yeah. Oh yeah, I, I've seen this with somewhat fresh eyes, and I don't necessarily like that anymore. I don't, you know. Now, I, now I see from a from a distance what I was formerly in the weeds with, and it and that was a very helpful thing. And I grew maybe a little as a filmmaker and as an editor, um, you know. Uh, and, and you know, you get influenced by seeing other people's work, and you see other ways of telling stories, and so it, it definitely evolved. You addressed a lot. Of yeah, we did very, very much. But the entire opening with the, the childhood. You know, from from his scene 2001 all the way up to when he when she bursts through the door, you know, it says Patrick B. Johnson, and it's now, it's now eight years later. That whole sequence was shot last year to to fill a hole in the movie that had been in the script but that had never really been shot, which was the childhood that led him to be this guy. Because the movie before you sort of jumped in and he was that guy, and you're sort of supposed to just get comfortable with that way too fast before you're already on the adventure with him. And, you know, we, we decided to slow it down just a touch, take your take some time to get to understand why he did this, so that when Donnie's character, you know, punches through that later in the film, you go, you really, you get it. You get it viscerally, not just sort of like, so oh, was okay. The was the nightmare of the whole elongation of the process actually turned out to be a really good thing? I think it did. I think the movie, you know, and I'm not just whistling past the grave. I mean, I really believe the movie is a better film for it having taken this long. No question. Yeah. So, anybody else? Maybe. Yes, in the back. Um, first, I got to glow a little bit. I love the movie. Um, I think I've been waiting a decade to see it, and it's been totally worth the experience. You weren't even born when we started. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my major question is, um, I don't know if anyone who's been noticing when Internal Credit for Rolling. Um, I know you wrote that song. 
But I, it, it was desperation. I mean, <laughs> it was free. Yeah, yeah, it was free too. Um, yeah, I don't get anything for that. Uh, and never, but I, but it, it, I have been monkeying around with a goofy little song for a long time. I'll tell you a scary story. By accident, right before the DCP was created to for the theaters everywhere, or 32 of them anyway, um, the sound mixer had gotten the wrong version of the song from the Dropbox and thrown it into the mix, and we almost didn't catch it. And what it was was the garage band demo that I had done with me groaning away through the lyrics just to give the melody to the actual talented singer. Patrick must singer. have called me and asked me a half dozen times. He's like, are you sure it's not? It's no longer in, in Because the when we heard it, I, I mean, we're watching the movie, everything's going along fine, and all of a sudden you hear, you can't get there from here. You know, and I'm like, oh! This was about to go to Deluxe to go into the DCP, and, and it was like, as we called the, the Tom Hamilton the mixer. And this is the weird, one of the weird things. I, I don't recommend, though. Though it worked out in the end. You know, Mike was in Illinois, I was in North Carolina. Our sound designer was in Minnesota. Uh, Deluxe and other, you know, other people that we were working with were in LA. It, and we're doing it all through the magic of technology. And the problem was, you know, if you're not in the same room and you can't walk up to each other's workstations and sit down and watch that timeline together, you're very likely to have errors like having Pat Johnson's horrible version of a song in your final mix. So <laughs> it, was, it was scary. Yes? I just wanted to say I really enjoyed Colleen's version of uh, Hooray for Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really, Patrick. He was uh, he was such a great director to work with. I, he really made me laugh. He was so inspiring. And what was exciting for me to, to work with him is I was a big fan of his as a writer and as a director. And uh, he was so precise about what he wanted. He was very very clear about everything that he wanted. And um, I, I think what's exciting about the movie is he really really having worked a lot in that period of you know, the 70s, he really captured it so, so well. I mean, just the way it looks. You see a lot of movies today that are period, take place in that time, and it doesn't have the texture, the feel, and I, I was really blown away. Well, it was fun because Colleen was brave enough to do stuff like dance around in, in, in the kitchen. And, and by the way, what, a weird thing that we were able to do was all of the locations that we used are the actual locations where the events took place. I mean, that living room where I lose my virginity is the actual living room where I lost my virginity. I mean, there was, it's like we literally went to all the places where these things happen, which doesn't mean much to outside observers except for the fact that for the actors and for me especially, I was able to, I don't know, somehow I felt more in tune with what was happening in the scene because I was like literally reliving it in the place. And there was a certain amount of ability of people to, I could communicate that with people. And I know you picked up on it being in the kitchen and being, you know. So <coughs> that was a real luxury, you know, to be able to go back to literally the, the, the very places where these moments took place to capture them again. Um, who else, anybody, before we knock off? Huh? Hi. Hi. 13 year uh, process. Besides financing, what were your biggest challenges? Um, continuing. <laughs> Getting up every, I mean, when you wake up every morning with it nagging you that you haven't finished this thing and that people are waiting and they, and you know, your, your, your friends, your relatives, your, your, your crew, your financiers are all kind of going, and? You know, literally every day. Um, but it was also one of those things where the longer it went, the, the, the more it was impossible to give up. Um, so I think that's really what, what the hardest thing was. Finding money, I mean, it's hard, and you know, I've got people here who stepped in to save me, and, and back there and all, all over the place who, who were there in, the, in my darkest hours. Um, but you can find that. You can, if you have friends and if you have people who believe in you, you'll find the resources. The physical resources and the monetary resources are, are, the, are in some ways, I shouldn't say the easiest thing to find, they're very valuable and they're very important, but finding the, the resource of saying, I'm going to put one foot in front of the other and keep doing this until it's done was the hard part. There were times when I, when I didn't 
want to give up, but I thought, I don't know how I continue, I don't, I don't know what to do. So that was the hard, it was, it was the psychology of how do you keep going when you're the only person pulling the train anymore, but luckily there was some people who <coughs> believed and kept with me that one, and Kathleen Barnes back there, and, and some of my friends, my dear friends out here, who helps a lot, Harry and Susan, Susie, <laughs> Susan, I call you Susan. Um, so, really shows John Lau, and John, and where's John Lau? Got John Lau, my, my, my dear um, friend and writing partner of nearly 40 years, and, and one, of the, one of the greatest producing partners in the history of the world. Um, and Sean Fisher, who stuck with me through the Candy Valley effects, where it was just he and I and a production designer and some cameras and a rainy warehouse shooting all this crazy stuff. So. Perseverance is just amazing. Was that? Your perseverance, I, I got a call from Patrick a week ago. It, and it's just stubbornness. And, it, and he, he said, oh, the movie, I said, the movie? I said, it's coming out? I said, it still oh, exists? I said, you with Patrick. And he said, yes, next week. I said, oh, you're, I can't believe it. I'll tell you, here, here's one example of how going on and pushing forward no matter what happens is important and you should all, anybody who's making films or doing anything needs to remember this. There was a moment where the original line producer on the film, Lee Jones, a very talented Chicago line producer who had worked diligently on the film for, you know, nearly a decade. She finally just said, you know, I, I'm start, I don't want to get bills anymore. I don't want to get, I don't want to deal with anything. You, I'm, I'm kind of turning this over to you. Here are the boxes. Have a nice life. Well, in the meantime, she had stored all of our negative at a document storage facility. Not a negative storage facility. A negative storage facility would never have done what the document storage facility did, which was the following. When they didn't get paid for 90 days, and they kept sending bills to her and she kept ignoring them, I finally called one day and said, you know, I haven't paid a bill from, I, I haven't seen something coming around. I'm gonna call them. And I called them and I said, I just wanted to make sure we're clear and our, our, our account was good, and they were like, uh, Hold on, I have to put you on hold. And then the owner of the company gets out and goes, oh, hi, uh, yeah, we tried reaching your producer for like 90 days and she didn't answer, so we did our usual thing. You know, we, we th took the boxes, I don't know what was in them, but that's what we do, we burn them. All of our negative vaporware. Wow. Now, luckily by then, all of it had been scanned digitally and turned into the files that we used to finish the film. However, you know, you, that meant never going back to the negative ever again. And when you hear something like that, that all of your negative is gone, what do you do? Do you go crazy? Do you erupt and scream and shout? No, you know, you do. You go, at least I don't have to worry about the negative anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, and you just, you know, but at that point you think, okay, please buy more hard drives. <laughs> and just keep buying them and buying them. So anyway, um, any last questions from anybody before? Yeah. Again, I'm super grateful to all of you, especially for staying so late with this. And thanks for being here. I thought what a great surprise. And thanks, Colleen. Steve, this was awesome. Thank you, guys.